nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. All right, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you'll be at and when you'll be listening to these lectures. Um, we'll continue our discussion on BioMEMS and BioNanotechnology. Uh, this is where we left off the first uh, lecture, and I'll just continue on from there. We talked about um, some fundamentals of fabrication and soft lithography, and then we were going through an overview of sort of fundamentals of micro and cell biology. We talked about DNA and the process of transcription and translation briefly. And I want to talk about the other sort of fundamental components of a cell, which is really proteins, and give you an introduction to proteins. So proteins are a very complicated three-dimensional folded structures um, that are composed of a linear chain of amino acids. And uh, just like uh, a nucleotide or a base is, a, is a, one of the basic units uh, of a DNA, uh, the basic repeating unit of, an amino acid, uh, uh, of a protein is really an amino acid. And one amino acid actually consists of this molecule here shown on the left. Um, it has this one side group, and these different side groups uh, basically um, what make the different amino acids. Uh, each um, one of these groups is connected to the next one through a peptide bond and this is really a chain but then when you actually uh, let this structure self-assemble then due to the bonds between the, the various side chains um, you can actually have a complicated three-dimensional folded structure. So as far as the protein goes, there are 20 different amino acids that make up an infinite number of proteins. Um, just like, again, the comparison to DNA, we had four specific different bases, and the combination of those four bases um, made the DNA. For proteins, you have 20 different amino acids, and these amino acids are listed here on the right, uh, alanine, arginine, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's 20 of them. Uh, and this can be found in any basic micro and cell biology or biochemistry book. Now, if you recall, within the mRNA, within the messenger RNA, there are actually three bases um, that we call the codon, or three, three uh, consecutive uh, bases are actually called a codon. And what happens is that um, the... Uh, um, these three bases, each, each combination of three bases basically um, specifically translates to one different amino acid. So four different bases in combination of three result in 64 possible codons. And it turns out that three of these are actually what's called stop codons, which tell um, the, uh, uh, the protein synthesis machinery, the ribosome, uh, to actually stop uh, performing the synthesis of the protein. So what you are really left with 61 specific amino acids and these, six, um, uh, uh, these 61 codons. And the 61 codons then specify the 20 amino acids. Hence, there is some degeneracy in the system. Okay? And this is really a table um, that uh, uh, tells us which amino acid corresponds to which base triplet or which codon. So y here you have the DNA base triplet and the corresponding mRNA codon. Okay? And the, the difference between this DNA base triplet and the mRNA codon is the fact that each triplet here, what you'll find is the complementary. So G C binds to G. Uh, so when the message is translated from a DNA to mRNA, then actually um, one of the strands uh, that is being read, um, it's actually uh, synthesized as a, as, a, as, a, as a complementary molecule. And then wherever you have um, a T, you basically replace that with a U. That's one of the differences between RNA and a DNA. RNA actually has, uh, it, it doesn't have the thiamine base, but rather has a base called uracil, U. So basically, when, the, when any of these uh, four triplets or four codons are found in the mRNA, then this, then, this, uh, then this translates to the alanine. Any of these six translates to arginine. Any of these 
um, let's say these two right here, GAA or GAG, they translate to uh, glutamate, and so on and so forth. Okay, and there is actually three stop codons here also. So one analogy that I found interesting from this website is this idea that actually uh, if you compare the information on DNA to the information in a computer, then a chromosome can be thought of as a floppy disk where you basically have all the stored information um, and the floppy disk has lots of different files while a chromosome has lots of different genes. And then each file has lots of different uh, char uh, characters, which is really a byte. These 8-bit characters is one byte. Well, in a gene, uh, this really is a codon, which is three bases, and which really is in the mRNA. And then a byte um, in digital systems is just a 0 or a 1, whereas in a codon, it can be A, T, C, G, or, or U. Um, and... Um, uh, basically, when these files get corrupted, when you have errors in the file, that sort of corresponds to mutation in the DNA when one of the uh, bases, let's say, somehow altered, and hence the protein that is supposed to be synthesized, uh, it doesn't get synthesized, or there is some, basically, malfunction in the protein synthesis process. Okay, so here's a basic summary of the microbiological concepts that I want to get across. Um, that the hereditary information is encoded in the chemical language of DNA and is reproduced in the cells of all living organisms. DNA is really composed of a string of four basic nucleotides referred to as A, G, C, and T, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. In all living cells, double-stranded DNA undergoes through the process called transcription. It's a very complicated process and a very, very important process of transcription to form single-stranded messenger RNA molecule. And then these messenger RNA, these are composed of four basic nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. And then the mRNAs then undergo through a process of translation by, the, by these uh, uh, machines, little machines called ribosomes, um, to form various proteins. So ribosomes synthesize the protein as they read the sequence um, of the mRNA and they read each triplet, each codon, what we call the codon, and translate that information to a protein. And these proteins basically then perform and enable all the critical functions of cell um, and hence critical functions of life. So you have DNA, RNA, bases, proteins that are made up of 20 amino acids. Uh, the RNA polymerizes, uh, the, the, the RNA polymerase uh, synthesizes the mRNA and ribosome synthesizes the proteins. And again on the right, this is shown again and schematically from a, uh, from a cell biology textbook where you have the double-stranded DNA, um, DNA transcription takes place and RNA synthesized and each triplet codon is read by um, the ribosomes to actually synthesize the proteins which have different amino acids. So um, the nucleotide sequence of DNA and its expression in various cells is really of utmost importance to life scientists and medical scientists because every disease state or every biological function could actually be traced back to a single or a group of genes, which is really uh, DNA sequence. And that's why there is such a need and such an importance to detect uh, DNA uh, and DNA sequence. Um, determination of signaling pathways of proteins is vital to understanding the functions of cells. Um, and if, if there is an error in the DNA sequence, then the correct protein is not is not produced, the protein that you want to actually produce that is not produced if there's a mutation in the DNA, and hence the various pathways and how a protein interacts with another protein, all the pathways changed. Uh, it's important to uh, keep in mind that information in DNA is more or less static. I mean, over a long period of time, you, you can have mutation, but in general, that information is static in all cells of the body. Uh, but the transcription translation processes are dynamic, and those are basically what are controlling how the cell reacts and performs its function. Um, so the transcription and translation processes then is how the information, the static information in DNA is being translated and transcribed and translated to a dynamic real-time protein synthesis. The protein synthesis is going on all the time in cells, and that's a, that's a dynamic process. 
And uh, genomics and proteomics, these fields have wide applications in biotechnology, medicine, agriculture, biology, etc. So uh, let me start to connect these molecules up with this concept of self-assembly, which is very important in, um, in biomems and bio-nanotechnology, um, and start to talk about DNA. So I'll, I'll, since we talked about DNA and proteins, I'll just use those molecules as examples to attach um, artificial objects to surfaces. So DNA, um, this very exquisite molecule, has also been used as a, as a link, or what I would call a bio-link or a biolinker uh, of, of a particular type. A protein could be another biolinker. So a DNA strand, as we know now, is specific to its complement. Okay, if you have a DNA strand of a specific sequence, G, T, A, C, and so on and so forth, then you can find complementary sequence that would uh, uh, bind to this first sequence uh, selectively. Okay, and hence we can use DNA as an address label, as an address and as an attachment chemistry, attachment linker or an attachment system to assemble objects. Okay. I'm gonna just quickly here pull up the pointer. Okay. Now uh, DNA can also be attached to gold coated objects via the sulfahydryl group. This chemical group, SH group, is also called the thiol group. And uh, what happens is that when you bring this, this group close to a gold surface, then the sulfur actually binds to the gold to form a metal thiolate bond. And this is a very well-known established chemistry. There's a lot of literature on this. If you go do a search on thiol chemistry or uh, gold sulfur attachment, you'll find lots of literature. So this is a pretty established scheme. Uh, to attach molecules to, to gold surfaces by actually attaching a sulfahydryl group to the end of the molecule. So right here, for example, you will actually have uh, a carbon chain, and then at the end of that, you will actually have a sulfahydryl group. Okay, And then through the sulfahydryl group, then you can actually attach this molecule to a gold surface through, through a bond called the metal thiolate bond. So um, it was shown some years ago uh, by Merkin and Elevisatos that you can actually um, take gold nanoclusters. Okay, so what they did was they took gold nanoclusters, and these were in the order of 10 to about 25 uh, nanometers. And then they showed that actually if you attach specific sequences of DNA to these nanoclusters, um, and then bring in a complementary sequence, then you can actually form this ordered array so this is in a liquid, but you can form this ordered array of these nanoclusters that assemble, that self-assemble, uh, depending on the sequence of the molecules. So here what you really have is you have these molecules, uh, 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 DNA molecules linking the gold nanoclusters in an organized regular array. Okay? And this can be done directly via two molecules, or actually in this particular case what they did was they had three molecules. They had the first um, uh, gold particle, here's a second gold particle. They had a molecule, a half a molecule here, half a molecule here, and then a third molecule that linked these two. And that's how uh, this, uh, this uh, ordered array was formed. A second biolink could be a protein, actually, some sort of a protein complex. So you can use um, um, things like this antigen antibody interaction. So antibodies. Um, actually are proteins. So, okay, antibodies are proteins that are these Y-shaped structures that have sites up here at the end that are called the antigen binding sites. And um, essentially these, these binding to an antigen, the antibodies bind to antigen through uh, a combination of forces, through hydrophobic forces, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and van der Waals interaction. So the interaction between antigen and antibody is quite complicated, and it's a combination of these forces. Um, or you can use uh, things like the ligand receptors and ligand receptor interaction. An example of a ligand receptor would be this complex called avidin biotin, which is also very, very commonly used in uh, molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, and uh, essentially, here the idea is that actually biotin is a vitamin. It's a small molecule. Biotin is a small molecule. It's a vitamin. And um, avidin is a protein. And is avidin, um, it actually has four binding sites. 
So what, four four biotins can bind to one avidin, okay? And they have a very strong affinity to each other. And what happens is then if you can attach avidin to one entity or one surface or one molecule and biotin to another one, then you can get those two molecules to attach to each other through this avidin-biotin interaction, okay? Attachment of... Um, Molec uh, of these proteins to surfaces is much more challenging than, than that of DNA. DNA is sort of much simpler because you can use the pre-established uh, thiol chemistry or you can also use silane chemistry. But attachment of protein is a bit more complex and one of the main reasons is that once you attach the proteins to surfaces, you want to make sure that the protein is still active. And what that means is the, the protein needs to keep its shape and its form. Um, for a protein to stay active and for a, for a protein to bind to another protein, it needs to keep its conformation and its, and its uh, shape. So attachment to surfaces is much more challenging and there, again there's a lot of literature on this also, but one example could be the use of avidin biotin. So for example, you can actually take a BSA molecule um, which is bovine serum albumin and attach this to an oxide surface um, through hydrophobic or charged interactions and the, bio, the BSA can actually be biotinylated. So you can actually have a biotin at this end of the BSA right here and this biotin can then be attached to an avidin layer and then you can have any other biotinylated molecule such as a protein or a DNA and then you can attach it to this avidin. So you can quite easily get DNA or proteins that are biotinylated, which, which means they have a biotin attached to it, and then use the avidin biotin chemistry to link them. So an example here for that uses actually a combination of these, uh, avidin and biotin and DNA, just to show you the concept, is uh, capture of beads um, only when you have the right complementary sequence. And this really is also the basis of many of the genomic detection schemes. Uh, the genomic detection schemes in microarrays is similar to this in some ways. Um, uh, and many other people have reported uh, basically different techniques for detection of small um, a sequence of DNA using uh, this kind of approach. So here what I'm showing you is a surface. So the here this could be silicon dioxide, for example, the green, the green layer. Then you have a gold layer that you have patterned. And then on this gold layer, you actually uh, attach your thiolated capture probe. So this could be a DNA probe with a thiol group, and that is attached to this gold layer. And now what you have is um, you can actually assemble um, or, or capture these avidin coated polystyrene beads. These are commercially available. You can get polystyrene beads or gold nanoparticles that, uh, that have avidin on them already, and they have been attached. Um, and then now what happens is that uh, you can get this second DNA, um, and actually this DNA can be biotinylated, for example. So the beads will only be captured when these two sequences are actually complementary and they actually bind. Okay? If these two sequences are not complementary, then the beads will not be captured. So you can have a thylated DNA, DNA2 plus the biotin, and the avidin coated polystyrene beads, and then bead capture on gold pads will occur only when you have these two strands to be complementary. On the right side, you see these AFM scans. This is just a control surface with, not, with nothing captured, just the roughness of the gold is shown here, whereas this image on the bottom right is actually, um, you can see the AFM scans or the capture uh, gold nanoparticles in this case and they were captured only because the two DNA strands were complementary. Okay. And this is again similarly uh, another example of the same concept. What's shown here is an array of gold pads. So each one of these round structures is a gold pad. This is a top view. It's an optical microscope. And in this particular case, the size of the gold pads was about 8, micro, eight micrometer diameter gold dots. And we used actually larger beads in this case. These were polystyrene beads. Um, and you can see that in the second case down below, when you actually had the complementary hybridization uh, of the second strand, then the beads were actually captured. And this is a zoom in picture of one of these 8 micron dots. And you can see lots of these little small dots, which are the beads captured. Whereas in the top case, when the sequences were not complementary, then the beads were not captured. Okay. So this ends uh, actually our first lecture, and I'm going to go ahead and now continue on to the second one.
And now what we'll do is continue a discussion um, on microfluidics and actually get to sensors and detection methods. So what I've done up to now is really give you an introduction to biomems, bio nanotechnology, sensors and biochips, and also talk about device fabrication a little bit. Uh, and then we went into cells, DNA, and proteins and gave you a brief introduction to cell and microbiology. And now uh, one very important concept that I want to briefly talk about is uh, microfluidics. Okay, so microfluidics is very important in, in these devices because you are, in, all, in mostly all cases, handling some sort of fluids, whether it's a body fluid or water or most of these biological entities like bacteria or cells or viruses, uh, you know, most of the time they are in some sort of fluid that you are analyzing. So that's why these devices are also called microfluidic devices. And um, um, just to briefly um, outline the, the basic uh, uh, theoretical concepts here, the fluid flow in general, and especially at these scales, is given by these Navier-Stokes equation. So this is a continuous fluid flow. is given by a well-known equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. This right here is a dimensionless form of this equation, um, where rho is the density, and you talk about velocities and other parameters here. If you scale this equation, you end up with this equation right here, where you have a parameter called uh, Reynolds number. Uh, let me pull up the uh, pointer here again. So again, this RE is a parameter, um, which once you scale this equation, then RE ends up being rho UL over mu, and RE is called the Reynolds number. Okay. Um, now, if you take this equation, the Navier-Stokes equation given here, and you take typical dimensions and typical uh, parameters that, that we have in microfluidic devices. So if you take, if you assume water, then water has a certain uh, viscosity given here by mu and a certain density. Um, and then the length scale. So let's say you're talking about length scales of in the range of micron. Let's say 10 microns. The velocities that you can achieve in these at these dimensions in these devices, uh, you know, range somewhere in the order of you know millimeters per second. Let's say. So let's say you have you know in the tens of millimeters or one millimeter per second. So if you take these number, then the Reynolds number ends up becoming 10 to the minus two. Okay. And this other parameter fr. Uh, this also fr to minus 2 ends up becoming about 100. So if you take these parameters, then this Navier-Stokes equation that we had here, if you assume that Re is actually very small, then this entire parameter, this entire term right here, ends up being very small compared to this term on the right. And basically the bottom line is that the Navier-Stokes equation really simplifies to Poisson's equation, okay, which we can handle and deal with much easier than the full Navier-Stokes equation. So that's why um, this, import, this concept of Reynolds number and its value is very important in microfluidic devices because if it is indeed small, if you, if you have, if you're working in these dimensions and these kind of materials, um, then um, the equations, the governing equation becomes very simple. So let's talk about Reynolds number a little bit more. So Reynolds number is given by um, this, the ratio of the dimension L and average velocity. Rho is the density of the fluid, and mu is the viscosity. Okay, so this is this is basically Reynolds number, and you can think of this as a ratio of the inertial forces over the viscous forces. So Re is really the ratio of the inertial forces. Uh, which is due to the sort of the mass or the weight of the of the fluid uh, uh, divided by the viscous forces, and it basically imp implies that at these scales inertia becomes relatively important. Okay, so L is really the most relevant length scale in your system, some characteristic length, and then I already talked about these other parameters. So. A, uh, um, a small value of Re or a reduced Re could be obtained either by having a very large uh, viscosity, and an example of that would be something like molasses. So if you can imagine how molasses or honey will flow, that's it's basically very viscous, okay? And that's one way to get a very um, small Reynolds number is to have the material being very viscous. Or you can have a reduced flow rate or reduced velocity. So, for example, uh, you know, if you are think of a very high traffic area, essentially where you just cannot, you just can't, you know, 
move very fast that would also translate to a low Reynolds number or you can have reduced dimension for example in micro devices so RE is usually much less than 100 often less than 1 and typically and most typically less than 1 in micro devices and hence what happens is that the flow is completely laminar it's completely dictated by uh, the Poisson's equation and there is really no, no turbulence that occurs at those scales so mixing, which is an important step in many chemical reactions, so if you're talking about making lab on a chips where you want to mix different chemicals or, or actually bring in two, two different chemicals and get them to react and perform a chemical reaction, well, that mixing, then it's really hard to do in these microfluidic devices because mixing happens only by diffusion. Okay, or you can use some novel structures that use hydrodynamics. So, for example, what you see here is a microfluidic device which has two inlets. One was here, so fluid, one type of fluid is coming in here on the top side, and the bottom, this green material, is basically a dyed fluid, and a second source of fluid is here. Okay, and uh, there's actually a line here on your slides that you'll be able to see, but maybe you can't see on the computer screen. So this is the, the boundary of the microfluidic device right here, what I'm shown in red. And th you can see that these two fluids don't really mix. They stay separated as they continue on. But then you can, you can design some novel structures, one shown here um, by Professor Renier's group published some time ago, where actually the fluid is coming in, but then there are these connecting regions. There are these smaller channels that have been etched that form connections, interconnections between, between um, this fluid. And actually you can see the mixing can then happen relatively fast in this case. Okay. Now, however, you can actually use this concept of, of um, uh, mixing only by diffusion, and you can use it to your advantage. Okay? And this is what's shown here. So you can actually separate particles by using this concept. Uh, and you can actually talk about um, a microfluidic particle separator device or a filter without a membrane, really. And the way you would do this is the following. The basic idea is that smaller particles will actually diffuse farther away and will get separated from the flow, whereas larger particles would actually have, they will go in their streamlines a little bit longer okay, and further away. So the diffusion distance, the characteristic, the characteristic diffusion distance uh, can be given by x squared um, equals 2 dt, whereas d is the diffusion coefficient and t is the time. And the diffusion coefficient of, um, uh, this is a simple equation for diffusion coefficient for a round object with the radius A, uh, K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, and A is the, is the viscosity, again, of the medium. So essentially, um, if you take the case of biotin, which is a small vitamin, then its diffusion coefficient is roughly in the order of 350 micrometers squared per second, whereas a larger protein like albumin has the diffusion coefficient about five to six times lower of about 60 to 65 micrometers squared per second. Okay, So what you can do is that essentially if you have uh, a fluid coming in with the mixture of these two protein, of, of these two elements, these uh, uh, vitamin uh, biotin and this protein albumin, then what's going to happen is that the biotin is going to be able to diffuse uh, away further from the streamlines so over a certain distance and, and that's what's shown here just conceptually um, and this uh, this device was developed by Paul Yeager at the University of Washington so if you have your fluid mixture coming in here and then some of the reference mixture uh, reference fluid here so this is some reference fluid let's say and here is your actual mixture then what happens is that over time and this over this distance uh, the smaller particles would diffuse away out of the stream and actually get to the other flow line and if you pull that fluid out in this H type geometry then the fluid that comes out here will contain only your reference fluid and the biotin whereas the fluid coming out here will still have both the elements. So essentially you have found a way to separate the biotin from the mixture without using any filters or any membranes. Okay. And down here is actually a simulation of this case using different uh, diffusion coefficients. Okay. So now in terms of microfluid devices, you need to find a way to drive the fluid through your devices. You need to push and move the fluid in the devices. Okay. So uh, how do you do that? So let me review some, some basic concepts of how do you actually move particles or move fluids um, in these microfluid devices. Okay. So the most uh, simplest method and the most obvious one is just a pressure-driven flow. 
So in this case, basically, you you know you connect the fluid to a pump, let's say, or a syringe pump, or a peristaltic pump, or some sort of a nitrogen pressure source, and you essentially drive the fluid by pressure by actually pushing it through. Okay. And in this case, there's some very standard equations that are given that you can you know, go look up in uh, basic fluid mechanics books. The, the fluid profile within a cross-section channel, let's say, is given by a parabolic profile. And this is assuming that you have a no-slip boundary condition, So, uh, which means that at the actual interface, your velocity is actually zero. This is what you assume first order calculations and using that you actually get a parabolic flow profile what's uh, sort of shown here is one example of that simulation this would be the case of a pressure driven flow so you can move a solution with cells or particles or DNA or proteins just by driving it through pressure another um, uh, method is what's called electrokinetic flow and these are really two basic techniques pressure driven flow or electrokinetic flow and electrokinetic flow, the basic idea is that you are somehow using some electrical property of the fluid or the particles to move them around. And in this case, you don't need external pumps, essentially, like you do in pressure-driven. You just need electrodes and a battery, and maybe on-chip electrodes to actually perform this electrokinetic flow. Electrokinetic flow can be divided into three types, electroosmosis, electrophoresis, and dielectrophoresis. And let me briefly give you an example or describe the basic theory for each, for each one of these methods. Electro, um, electro osmo, I'm sorry, okay, went the wrong way. Electroosmotic flow is described here. So here, the basic idea is that in, in electroosmosis is that your channel surfaces, the surfaces that make up your microfluidic device. So for example, in most cases, it's silicon dioxide or some sort of an insulator. So here, I'm showing you a cross section of that. Now, what happens is that on an in an oxide, a silicon oxide surface. If you actually expose the surface to a fluid of pH 7, let's say, then what happens is that on the surface of oxide, you have these silanol groups, OH. There's actually OH groups, okay? So this is the surface of the oxide with silicon, and there are these OH groups that are exposed. Now what happens is when you actually put this in a fluid, then this OH groups gets deprotonated. The hydrogen comes off, and you actually form this OH minus, okay? So deprotonation of silanol group occurs when the pH value of the aqueous solution is above the PZC. PZC is a parameter called point of zero charge. It's also called isoelectric point. So this is the same as isoelectric point. And essentially what that the isoelectric point or PZC is the value of pH at which the charge is neutral on the surface of a material. So it turns out that silicon dioxide has a PZC or isoelectric point of about 2 to 3, which means that if you put solutions of pH higher than that and expose them to the oxide, then the surface will actually get negatively charged. Okay. So what happens is that on surfaces of oxide, or by the way, this is the same applies for glass, because glass is really a form of oxide, uh, glass or quartz, they get negatively charged in most typical cases of, let's say, pH between 4 to 9. Okay? This negative charge that is fixed attracts this positive ions from the fluid. So in the fluid, you have, might have a combination of negative and positive ions, and you're going to attract these positive ions and get them close to the surface, and these positive ions form a diffuse mobile layer. Okay? This actually, well, actually, these positive ions um, accumulate in, in two layers. One, the first layer is called the stern layer. The stern layer is the positive ions that are most closest, that are the closest to the surface and they are mostly fixed they don't really move so the stern layer is usually fixed okay this is typically fixed so those ions are not moving they are basically partially shielding this charge but then you have additional positive ions that you need to shield the negative charge but these ions are uh, just a little bit further away and they are in a mobile layer they are mobile so they can actually move around so now what happens is that if you actually apply a potential let's say positive hair and negative hair using electrodes in the fluid, what happens is that these mobile ions, so for example, if you had KCl here in the solution, you has potassium chloride as the background ionic solution, then the potassium ions here are actually going to move. The mobile 
uh, layer, the potassium ions in the mobile layer will actually move to the right to the negatively charged electrode and as they move you are also going to actually drag the fluid along with that okay and in the same um, at the same time actually you also have negative charges moving in the other side so you also have electrophoresis that takes place which I'll talk about next but um, the movement of these diffused mobile layer then drags along the fluid molecules the water molecules or whatever else you have along with them and hence the fluid moves basically in this case net to the right okay if you were to choose a surface that gets positively charged, then by applying the same voltage, the fluid will actually move in the other direction. So uh, this uh, uh, electroosmosis can be characterized by this electroosmotic flow charge, and you can calculate that by this equation. E is the electric field. Um, is, uh, this parameter right here is called the zeta potential and eta is the viscosity, A is the cross-sectional area, and this is epsilon. So essentially you have these charges at the interface. Using that, you can actually calculate the charge and the electroosmotic flow that is a function of the electric field. Okay? Now in this particular case, what happens is that as you can see, that close to the surface, you have these diffused mobile layers that are actually moving. So what you end up getting is more uh, results in a plug-like flow okay in a plug like flow so if you were to compare the pressure driven velocity profile the pressure driven velocity profile is like this so here what we're showing is actually um, this is velocity in this in this axis and this is just uh, position i guess x so the velocity um, profile of a pressure-driven flow is more parabolic, as I mentioned earlier, whereas the velocity profile for electroosmotic flow is actually more like a plug. And it's important to note that during an electroosmotic flow, you also have electrophoresis that is taking place. Okay. And this slide, um, I just will leave in there and briefly mention it. This reference is here. Uh, it's, uh, it becomes a very interesting and complicated effect when you talk about scaling this down to nanoscale channels because in this case, you have very few ions that are present and hence you can actually simulate individual ions and that's what's done in this, in this paper. Uh, in this case, they actually assume um, uh, positive fixed charges on the surface and you have a stern layer which is these negative charges and then you have these mobile negative charges that are, uh, that are available to actually move under an electric field. Okay, the next uh, mechanism to move fluids and charges is called electrophoresis. And electrophoresis is basically the separation of charges in a fluid. So what you do is that you put electric field across your medium and charge species will drift and they will actually basically move. They will, they will go through the process of drift. And the velocity is given by the negative of mobility times the electric field, which is dvdx. So this is the same as the mobility or the drift of electrons or holes or any charge carriers in a field, okay? Except that the, the mu here, this factor, is now the electrophoretic mobility of your particular uh, entity that you're trying to move. This could be DNA, for example. It could be proteins or it could be cells. So uh, electrophoresis is used very, very widely to separate DNA. If you recall now, going back to the fundamentals of DNA, uh, DNA, there was a negative charge on each phosphate ion, which was part of the backbone. Okay, So each base, essentially, uh, or each nucleotide, had a negative phosphate along the backbone. And hence, if you have a 20 base long molecule, then you have 20 negative charges because of the 20 phos uh, one charge per phosphate ion. And that negative, those negative charges are fixed on the backbone. So what happens in a fluid is, let's try to draw this here, if you have DNA like this with negative charges on the backbone that's fixed, then this negative charges in a fluid, it will actually attract positive charges to counter the negative charges, okay? So if you have a negative single-stranded negatively charged DNA, DNA that you put in a fluid, then the positive ions are going to accumulate around the negative charged DNA to shield that phosphate uh, charge, okay? 
But what happens is that when you actually put this molecule and put it under an, uh, under an electric field, then it will get partially ionized. It will get ionized to a certain extent, not completely, but to a certain extent. And then what happens is that the negative charges will stay, of course, on the DNA. The positive charges will move, let's say, to the negative electrode if you have one. And the rest of the molecule itself, then, the molecule itself will move in the direction of the positive charge. So you can actually get the DNA to move in in an in a electric field. So DNA has a phosphate backbone which is negatively charged and hence the DNA can drift in an electric field. The, it's interesting to note that the charge to mass ratio is actually constant in DNA because as you increase the basis, as you make it longer, then this charge to mass ratio really stays the same. Hence electrophoretic mobility is actually independent of size in a liquid medium. All right, So actually you will not get any differences in mobility with different length of DNA in a liquid medium. Thus, what you really need is you need a sieving medium. You need a, some sort of a sieving matrix to actually introduce friction where separation can then take place due to difference in length because then a longer molecule will experience more sieving friction and hence it will move at a different rate. So the separation region then is usually filled with a gel which is this, a sieving matrix with pores through which DNA molecules can actually traverse. Okay? The field also stretches the molecules and they move in a snake-like fashion through the pores of the gel. So what happens is that you have this material which is porous, it basically has gel, and then one particular DNA will actually get stretched and then move through this gel when it's actually stretched and moves like a snake essentially through this gel. Mobility in gels is inversely proportional to the log of the fragment size. This is called the sieving effect. And again, there's a lot of literature on gel e electrophoresis. If you're more interested, you can you know, certainly do a search and, and read that up on your own. I'm just giving you a brief overview of it. And in microbiology, typically two types of gels are used to separate DNA. There is a thing called polyacrylamide gel, which is used to separate DNA molecules that are short, that are in the order of 10 to, 50, uh, 10 to 500 bases. And in this gel, the pores end up being typically small. Or you can use agarose gel to actually separate larger molecules. Okay. So DNA electrophoresis is very, very important and very fundamental to um, uh, microbiology and cell biology and, and also to microfluidic and uh, uh, biomems devices. So let's talk about that briefly. So what happens is that in this particular case, then you actually set up um, this, this gel and the gel actually has um, essentially, uh, you know, the, you actually put, uh, load the fragments on one side. So let's say you have the electric field here, positive and negative. And what's going to happen is that you'll actually load the DNA on this side. Okay, Right here you can load the DNA and then you run the gel for a certain amount of time. So you actually drop a solution with the DNA and then you apply the voltage and wait. And what happens is that the DNA will actually move and then depending on its length, it after some time you will actually, if you label the DNA with some dye, then you will see these bands at different positions and how far the band moves is really then a function of its length. So the separation delta L can be given by the change in the electrophoretic mobility, electric field and time because these two parameters are constant. The resolution of separation is actually measured by these planes N where N is given by the number of distinguishable bands within the length of gel squared and this N is also equal to mu times the voltage you are using divided by two times the diffusion coefficient of that molecule. So higher voltage actually increased resolution but also joule heating is a big issue because in this case the material is really an insulator. The po the, uh, these polymers are pretty much an insulator and hence you need to apply pretty large voltages to be able to drive the DNA through. Um, and separation can be done in capillaries since higher electric fields can be used. So that will result in higher velocities and shorter times. And uh, this is actually how gel electrophoresis is done or DNA electrophoresis is done. You actually have, for example, this you can see this is a physically a reasonably large gel. Um, uh, this particular case actually is this actually the final result, but essentially the gel is about the size. It could be as small as a few inches to almost six to seven inches or longer. 
and what you do is then you have a power supply with a voltage across it this material is filled with gel there's glass plates across it and then you have these little wells where you load your mixture of DNA fragments of different sizes and then you run this for a certain amount of time this is shown vertically here but it doesn't need to be vertical gravity doesn't play a role here it's just shown that way uh, but essentially the molecules of these different the molecules with different sizes will move and they are labeled and hence after some time that you have run the gel you take a picture of this and then you get these bands and from those bands then you can estimate or you can extract how many different fragments you have with specific length and this right here is actually an actual photograph copy of a gel they had four lanes you see there are four lanes and you see this bunch of bands and uh, always what you also have is a calibration ladder what's called a calibration ladder where you have a mixture of molecules with known length and known length fra I mean fragments with known lengths that's, that can be used as a calibration okay so this is very important because you want to be able to then separate DNA uh, using this concept and actually DNA electrophoresis has been performed in a chip there's been quite a few examples uh, one most notable one I'm showing here and in this particular case um, in general when you want to load the sample that also provides um, I mean that's also is a challenge how do you actually load a small DNA sample into the chip so what you do is you use the following concept you actually make this junction okay and you load up the solution between electrodes one and three let's say here so here's one channel you put two electrodes across this one channel one and three and you have two electrodes across this channel and these electrodes are two and four so what you do is you first apply you would out here in this well out here you will actually have a big opening where you can use a pipette for example or, or a microfluidic connector to actually put in your fluid and then you also have an electrode in the same region and this will be your that's a negative electrode and here is a positive electrode with another well that's not shown here so you actually push the fluid through using either electrodes or a pressure driven flow so using electrophoresis you could actually fill this region with the fluid or you just using pressure driven flow and you can uniformly load this well okay so once you have uniformly loaded this well between electrode one and three or between channels this is the this channel then you can actually now apply a voltage between two and four and simply move along this little plug that is in across this channel now you can simply take that away and use that as your sample so this can be the sample which has the fragments of DNA and now you can run this through a long channel and separate this over time okay so DNA electrophoresis on a chip uh, can actually it needs small sample size because you're loading a very small channels and very small volumes you can apply higher fields and hence you can get higher velocities and because you can get higher velocities you can also get faster results so what shown here is an actual picture of this plug so in this particular case there's actually two inlets for sample and a waste the sample comes in here and is gone out this way the sample goes this direction and then right here you have the anode and the cathode and you can see that um, actually a plug right here this is the plug that's actually pulled out and moved in this direction essentially and then you can again flow your next sample and then pull plug out to run that again and shown here is one of these examples of a small device that had a channel that was 500 microns by 50 microns um, in cross-section and they actually showed the separation of a 50 base pair molecule 8 volts per centimeter was electric field uh, they filled the the channel with polyacrylamide and they used a dye the cyber green dye to actually label the DNA and after running the gel for some time you can see these bands and these bands essentially they showed that you can separate let's say a 500 base pair long molecule versus a 550 base pair long molecule in about two minutes okay all right the third concept to move fluids or particles that I want to talk about is called dielectrophoresis okay so we talked about electroosmosis and electrophoresis now let me briefly talk about dielectrophoresis and actually this is a good time to stop the second lecture and we'll continue this discussion in the third lecture